Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. I'm Pam Larickia, longtime unschooling mom and author. Join me and my wonderful guests for interviews, information, and inspiration about unschooling and living joyfully with your family. You can find the episode show notes, your free introductory ebook, What is Unschooling?, and lots more information at livingjoyfully.ca. And here's the show. Hello, explorers. I'm Pam Larickia, and this is episode number 150 of the podcast. <laughs> wow, that is so cool. <laughs> and it's the 14th of November, 2018, as I record this intro. So this week, I have a lovely conversation with Sue Elvis. Sue and her husband, Andy, have eight children, seven living, ranging in age from 14 to 31. Sue hosts the podcast Stories of an Unschooling Family, as well as a website and blog. We dive into her family's move to unschooling, the difference between unschooling and unparenting, how unschooling has grown into a lifestyle for the whole family, what has surprised her most along the way, and lots more. As a personal update, I want to mention that registration for the Fall 2018 Expedition of the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit closes next Tuesday, November 20th at midnight. Here's what one of our participants, Alice, shared. The Childhood Redefined Summit is just such an incredible experience. No matter where you are on your unschooling journey, whether you're just starting out or many years in, you will not regret taking advantage of the opportunity to have these three amazing women at your fingertips. The combination of their experience and insight, together with their open hearts and the ongoing support they provide, is truly priceless. See, the summit is not us sharing a map to the world of unschooling with step-by-step -step directions for you to diligently follow. But you are definitely signing up for an incredible journey. Instead, we, and which is Anne Oman, uh, Anna Brown and myself, we're holding up a lantern and walking alongside you, sharing our stories and insights, helping to light your path as you do the deep personal work that is necessary to peel away the layers of conventional scripts and expectations because it's those voices that can get in the way of cultivating a thriving, unschooling spirit and energy in your family. So you can find all the details and register to join us at childhoodredefined.com or just click the link in the show notes. As a community update, I want to thank everyone who has chosen to support my unschooling work like this podcast and my website through Patreon. And a big welcome to new patron, Alicia Stimmel. Hi, Alicia. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. Their generous support is vital to helping me freely share information and inspiration with anyone who's curious and wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. If you'd like to join my community of patrons and scoop up some great rewards along the way, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash exploring unschooling. And with that, let's get to my conversation with Sue. Welcome. I'm Pam Larickia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Sue Elvis. Hi, Sue. Hi, Pam. Hi. Sue hosts... This is really exciting for me. Is it? That's lovely. Sorry, Pam. Oh, that's okay. Me. <laughs> it's exciting for me too. I was very excited that uh, you agreed to come on. If people don't know Sue, Sue hosts the podcast Stories of an Unschooling Family as well as a website and blog. And I really enjoyed listening to and reading about snippets of their unschooling lives. And I, as I said, I'm very excited that she agreed to come on and chat with me. So to get us started, Sue, can you share with us a bit about you and your family? Yes, Pam. Uh, we, are, we live in Australia. We are about one and a half hours south of Sydney. We live in a village um, surrounded by the beautiful Australian bush, which if everybody, if anybody looks at my photos, um, that's obvious. All my photos <laughs> are set in the bush. That's my favourite place. Um, I'm married to Andy. 
uh, he's a primary school teacher, which is a great conversation starter for unschoolers. And we have eight children. We have five girls and three boys. That's um, seven living children. And we have a baby, Thomas, who died, or I think it's about 19 years ago. His anniversary is just coming up. And our eldest child is 31, which is rather frightening. And our <laughs> youngest is 14. So I've got two children under the age of 18, but we're all unschoolers. So, awesome. sort of that's the facts, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> it keeps you busy, right? Uh, busy. Um, life isn't as busy as it used to be as far as my kids go because I found that as they get older, I, they turn around and they help out with me and I've got lots of free time these days, but I am busy, but just doing other things. Yeah. So, you know, but- all, all, all the unschooling stuff, like I'm still busy learning things myself and uh, I do a lot of things online. I've got a lot of contacts and things I'm in, interested in. But as far as having to do homeschooling, because we're registered homeschoolers as well as unschoolers, life is a lot easier these days because I only have to report for one child and that makes it much, much easier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. And you know, when it's interesting when you talk about, uh, you know, when I I make a comment that sounds busy, you know, that's a pretty typical comment to make. Um, But it's not about the busyness. As you said, you know, it's, it's kind of like the flow, isn't it? That, that comes and goes with life. Like when we have moments, we're learning ourselves, you know, we're always choosing what we're filling our time with, right? We are. I think that we're the type of people that we have so many things that we want to do. So being busy isn't bad, but being busy, we haven't got enough time. Yes, we're just, the world is an exciting place and there's lots to do. And that's a lovely sort of busyness. Yeah, exactly. So I was curious, how did you discover unschooling and what did your family's move to unschooling look like? Well, I think maybe our um, discovery of unschooling was atypical. We, I knew that we could homeschool because my mother homeschooled my youngest brother. Uh, he's quite a bit younger than me. I am the oldest. And so I knew all about homeschooling. And so that when our first child got to the age of about five, we wanted a homeschool. We knew that. And... Uh, that didn't mean that we weren't sort of scared about it because we didn't know anybody else apart from my mother who was homeschooling. And when we did get into contact with other homeschoolers, we sort of stepped into the unschooling environment. Everybody around us, well, there weren't that many people. This was, this was 26 years ago. Mm-hmm. There weren't that many people homeschooling, but the people that we did find were unschoolers sort of people that were prepared to step outside of the normal. They they weren't interested in the system, the education system. I think unschooling does attract a lot of people who are brave enough to go their own way. And we just happened to meet up with these people. I went to a couple of conferences and everybody was so enthusiastic, excited about learning, the love of learning and how kids don't need to be forced to learn, all that sort of thing. And I got very, very inspired. And I also uh, got John Holt's magazine um, that called Growing Without Schooling, I think. Mm-hmm. It, was still being, it was still being delivered to letterboxes at that time. We'd get it in the mailbox, you know, once a month or whenever it was. <laughs> and that was an inspiration as well. So we did start off as unschoolers. But the problem was uh, we didn't really understand unschooling. I thought it was just we step back and we just let our kids get on with it. They, they were all wired to learn, so I didn't have to do anything. But not only did I not have to do anything, I couldn't do anything because I'd interfere with the natural process of learning. And after a while, I found my kids weren't doing all the wonderful things I'd been told they would do. I 
gone to a conference and they told me about all these stories about kids who、uh, rewired houses or they drew frog after frog after frog and filled up the walls and they they were asked to go to all these concerts and well my kids weren't doing anything and I I couldn't understand why. And one day I decided that unless I introduced a few things to my children, things that I thought they might be interested in, and some of my passions like Shakespeare and poetry, I wondered whether they would actually ever find out about them. Would they really stumble across them by themselves? And before we knew it, we'd left unschooling because. Yes, I didn't understand, and I was attracted also by by other ideas. So I had a friend who, oh, she she had three marvelous boys. They did everything. They were pianists and ballet dancers, and they performed in the theater, and they were clever. And she did a sort of like unit study approach, though I don't think she called it that. But she did a lot of structured stuff with them, and I guess that we get. Tempted to follow somebody else's pathway, sometimes I just looked at her kids and I thought, I want that for mine. And we left unschooling behind for quite some time while we went exploring other、um, avenues. Yeah, looking looking for the perfect way to homeschool. No, that's really really interesting and such a great point too.、Um, You know, looking back now, you start. You've come to realize what it was that was was missing, and and we're going to get into that a little bit later as well in the conversation, right? <laughs> But it's yes. such a great point, you know, that when you're learning and and figuring this stuff stuff out, and you're connecting with people, and you're seeing、um, what they're doing, and seeing their kids in action, you know, it's all learning for ourselves, isn't it? And and learning for our children in that、um, we're figuring out ways to engage with the world and explore the things that we're interested in. Yes, I think also that homeschooling, from a parent's point of view, is a whole new、uh, area, and it is exciting looking at the educational philosophies. And almost sometimes we get caught up in discovering things for ourselves, not necessarily for our children. So that we forget to look at our children. We read all the books about Charlotte Mason or classical, and it's all very, very exciting. And we want to try things out and what will work. And it was a very exciting time in some ways, but also very difficult as far as trying to fit my kids into all these different methods.、Uh, If you understand that, it well, just、uh, that's a that's a, I, such a great point, Sue. You're right that that when we're doing all this research and reading about them all, we're all looking at them through our lens, right, and seeing how we imagine our family fitting into it, and then we get this lovely picture in our head of what we think it's going to look like if we do it this way, or we do it this way, or we do it this way, and then, like you said, then you're you're kind of picking one and trying to get your kids to fit into it, right? That's right, and it all does sound good, you know, in the books.、Uh, yeah, we, we were mainly we were mainly books because we didn't have the internet in those days, which was probably good because oh, it is good to connect with other people. But I think I would have had even more information to plow through. And my poor children, yes, I they were experiments. We would depend from one thing to another and back again, and yes, they. We're happy for a certain length of time, and I was happy because we started off, and a new method was exciting. But it didn't take long for the,、uh, the you know, for things to fall apart again. Nothing was the answer because I think that I was well, I was definitely forgetting to listen to my own children, listening to everybody else, and、uh, trying to fulfill other people's expectations without. Looking at my children and seeing what their needs were, trying to make them conform to other people's ideas of what they should be doing. So, what was kind of、uh, what was it that that brought you back to unschooling?、Uh, getting fed up of going around and around the circle, <laughs> I think. And so, our family life was falling apart because when children. Aren't happy 
uh, when I wasn't happy, the children weren't happy. I was making them do things. And they would say to me, but mom, why do we have to do this? And in the end, I stopped and I thought, well, why do they have to do it? It doesn't really make much sense. And I guess that was the point where I started thinking that there must be something better, not another method, but uh, listening to my kids and working it out for ourselves. But I, I wanted something that, well, I, we had to do something that didn't cause the battles between us because our relationships were oh, just disintegrating. Also, I had babies and toddlers and older children, and I couldn't fit them all into my life. And I used to be called the dragon mother because I used to get so overwhelmed. I'd boil up inside and my kids could see that I was going to explode and oh, I'd rush outside and sit out there and think about things. My poor kids, I'd just look up at them through the window. They'd be looking at me and I was thinking, there must be something better than this. I'm not the mother I want to be for my kids, but I do love them so very much. This is not the way life should be. And that's when we stopped uh, trying, well, I stopped trying to conform my children to somebody else's ideas. And yeah, we didn't actually look for another method. I just sort of stopped doing the things that were causing us all the problems. But we, they sort of fell away one by one and until we were happy that the things were working for us. Wow. But I didn't know we were unschooling. That yeah. was the next I step love- down the track. I just... Yeah, no, I was going to say, I love that you were just taking things away that weren't working, right? Just like, okay, that's not, that's not working. That's not working until you ended up in a place you were comfortable with. And then it was later on that you're like, hey, this meshes with unschooling. That's right. Because my kids were very interested in learning. They had lots of interests. That wasn't the problem. It was pushing those out to Uh, do the things that we thought we had to do, or I thought my kids had to do. And so, yes, we just stopped doing all those things. And then when people used to say to me, oh, Sue, what method of homeschooling are you using with my kid, your kids? I was very vague. I just used to say, oh, look, we do our, we do our own thing. We like follow our interests. We read lots of books. We go on outings. And then I changed the subject <laughs> because I didn't really know what we were doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just that. And it wasn't until, oh, maybe, I don't know, eight or nine years ago, I was reading Susie Andres's uh, homeschooling books, um, what they called um, Homeschooling with Gentleness and A Little Way of Homeschooling. And I suddenly realized that what we were doing did have a name. Other people were, were doing it. We were unschooling. And from that experience, it makes me feel that unschooling isn't sort of something that you you read a book about and then put the steps into action like you would Charlotte Mason. It's very, very natural that this is the way our kids are supposed to be learning. We can get there by ourselves if only we listen to our kids. Uh, it's not something that we're imposing on them. They... They're just naturally wired to learn. And if we listen and respond and help them, we will get to one schooling that way. I love that because, yeah, that's, to me, that is the essence of unschooling, right? When you're connecting with your, with your children and, and that's the way that humans are wired to learn, right? It's the same with um, you know, I later on heard the phrase attachment parenting and read a bit about it, but it was pretty much the way I was connecting with my children, the way I just felt worked best for our relationship. You know what I mean? So I can totally see how that's, you know, unschooling really is about supporting human beings, how they learn, because our children learn, you know, they don't have as many, you know, connections or experience with the world as we do, but we still learn in the same ways, don't we? We still follow our interests. We still are curious. We are still, you know, just engaging with the world and seeing what happens, right? 
Yes, and as you just said about attachment parenting, I think that really it is, if we didn't think about school, we just continued what we were doing, then we would get there anyway, that I'm the same as you when my kids were little. I just did what I felt was the right thing to do with my kids. I just carried them around, fed them, despite everybody saying you shouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But it was the thing I felt they needed. And I remember those days when we used to, well, I used to walk around and show my kids things and take them swimming and put them under a tree in the shade and give them words of things and just introduce them to the world, the world. And that's how they learned. And that's what unschooling is really, isn't it? That we just keep on doing that. Just uh, keep on surrounding them with the world and helping them discover things and things they're interested in, things they need to know, that type of thing. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's... It's not, that. it's, not mis, mis, it's not a big mystery, really, no. is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, and that's great. You know, that's the... Because it at first because it feels natural. Maybe that's why people feel like, well, we're not doing anything. You know what I mean? And and they feel oh. that we need to be doing something. Because I I remember, you know, as I said, I felt I was kind of naturally attachment parenting, and this is before I even knew homeschooling existed. And I re- I still distinctly remember having a conversation with my sister in law when my youngest had just basically reached school age, and she was a special needs teacher at school. And she was commenting on how we're always taking the kids places and we're doing things with them and, and, and how that was going to put them um, so far ahead. And I remember being just so taken aback, like, isn't that just what people naturally do with their kids, you know, live their lives together and have fun and show them things and talk with them and and do all those things. That just seems so natural to me. (laughs) Yes, I agree. But talking about um, doing nothing, it just reminds me of when I was going around and around that circle of trying all the different homeschooling methods. I did consider unschooling and I thought, no, well, I, I thought, yes, that might be the answer because I won't have to do anything. Mm. It will be so easy. I'll just sit back. I can step outside the circle, let my kids just get on with it. I'll, I will be, I can just, it might be the answer. And then I thought, no, I can't do that because that's, isn't that lazy? People will say, Hey, you're just too lazy to write a curriculum for your kids. And you can't just let your kids um, get on with it. And I had, of the wrong idea of unschooling because I was still influenced by my early experiences of unschooling. Even though we can, our kids do get on and learn and they don't need us to write the curriculum or anything for them. It isn't lazy and we're all involved a lot more with our kids than people might think. But that initial, uh, when I was considering it, thinking, no, this is a lazy way of doing things. And I think that's a problem when people think about unschooling. They do have negative image of it, like, you know, that unschooling parents are just too lazy to organize their kids' education. They're irresponsible. Mm-hmm. They do hear that sometimes. Oh, yeah. No, exactly. And you know what? That leads so nicely into one of our next questions, which is um, the difference between unschooling and unparenting. Because you recently wrote a blog post on the topic, and I recently found myself in a conversation where that misconception between those two things soon became obvious, you know, that, that they thought they were the same thing as well. So how do you explain the difference? Uh well, let me think about this one. Yeah. Uh, I think yes, I think that when that perhaps unparenting is when parents step back and they let their kids do whatever they like, even if that isn't good for them. So that with so that you know, they say that my children can do whatever they like. I'm not going to influence my child, but that may end up, the situation might be that the child ends up doing things that aren't good for their health, aren't good for them, you know, their development. 
whatever. They're not learning the skills that they need to get on in the world. But unschooling parents know that kids have to be free to make their own choices. We can't say things like, you have to do this or you have to do that. But letting kids make their own choices isn't enough. That we want our kids to use their freedom to do what is right, not necessarily what they like. And the choices that the child makes should be beneficial to the child, if you understand. Um, if I, I'm not probably not explaining that well. But people say, well, how do you get kids to do what is right? And then I think that is all to do with our connections, that we have to connect with our kids so that they respect us, they trust us, they know that we love them and that they, you know, we become the most important people to them so that they listen to us. And when we got those connections, that we can share what we think is right and wrong and what we would like for our children. And they do listen to us. So they have the choice, but they're going to make choices, we hope, because kids do make mistakes and so do we all. Yeah. But on the whole, kids will make the right choices for themselves. And that might be sometimes making the right choice, which benefits somebody else rather than themselves. But yeah. I yeah. probably haven't explained that very well. Oh no! I mean, that's what sense. how I. Yeah, it makes sense to me. It's, it it is you know them making the the when you say the right choices, totally, and it's it's the right choices for them in the moment. But as you say, we're there with that connection, right? So we're involved in their conversation as they're as they're analyzing, as they're picking, as they're choosing. We're there, you know, when they make a choice to chat with them about what happened from that, you know what I mean? So that they're gaining and processing real experience from that. And, uh, you know, to me, the unparenting thing tied in with the, the lazy aspect, you know, lazy parenting, when people think of unschooling as, like you had said before, you thought, oh, I could, you know, just sit back and let them do their own thing, Right. If I choose this way, I'm going to leave it all up to them and then off they go and, and not interfere. I remember right back at the beginning, that was something that stood out for me when you said, you know, that I shouldn't be interfering with them. Connecting with them and talking yeah. with them is not interfering, right? That's engaging with them. That's, that's having a relationship with them versus, you know, leaving them on their own to figure everything out. That's not, that's not fair to them either, right? No, I like that word, engaging. I think that um, maybe some people think that unschoolers can't give their opinion to their children, or of course we listen to their opinions as well, but that whole thing of being able to talk, we talk all the time about everything mm -hmm. and to have those conversations where we're not lecturing and we're not telling our kids this, that or the other, but we're just swapping ideas and listening to each other and learning from each other because sometimes I learn from my kids you know I, I, especially now they're teenagers and they've been thinking a long time they know a lot about unschooling and learning and life and sometimes I am very surprised about what they come out with the, the and especially as their children, you know, you, sometimes we think that we know better because we're the adult, but they're the person that's learning. They're the person uh, that knows what's important to them. They, they know how they learn best. And I think sometimes we forget to actually go and listen to our kids and discover some answers from them rather than from other people or ourselves or the internet or whatever. We stop, forget to stop and listen to our own children. Oh, I know. And it's amazing what, what you, you learn from them, right? The, the insights, the things that they put together, the connections they make, the observations they make that, you know, it's spectacularly fun to chat with them, isn't it? Oh, very much. It's such a privilege. Quite sometimes when I'm writing, I will stop and I will say to my kids, Hey, I'm writing about this. What do you think? And they come out instantly with something that I can use, something I think, wow, that's a wonderful insight. Uh, yes, they, mm. they're, they're really cluey. You know, they, 
they think about things. I think in some ways our kids know more about things than we do. We're still, I don't know about you, Pam, but I'm not, not really these days, but a lot of us are held back by our upbringings, our ideas that we've accumulated along the way, but our unschooling children aren't held back by those things. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, right. That I mean, that's, and that's part of our choices too, and to have a different kind of relationship with them. We're not piling on all those different kinds of um, expectations and judgments on them. Because that's the other thing I was going to mention when we talk about engaging with them and having conversations with them. And and like you said before, like having real conversations where we can share our opinions. The difference is that I think when people first hear about unschooling, that is so confusing for them is, is, you know, you know, you're talking to your kids and then your kids are deciding what they're going to do is... Because our conversations aren't loaded with those judgments and expectations, like, okay, we're having a conversation, but you can hear from the tone of my voice what choice I want you to make. But no, we're actually um, having that conversation, helping them um, explore what they think and what they see and what their choices are. And we're doing that in support of them instead of trying to subtly control them. Does that difference make sense? Yeah. Yes, it does. I think a lot, we are very good as humans, as parents, uh, by not saying a lot so that people can't point your f- the finger at us and saying, well, you said this or you said that, and you'll say, well, I didn't say that, but we can give the subtle messages by our body language or our tone of voice or whatever. Mm-hmm. Our kids know when they can trust us and what well, that the trust yes we need to be able they need to be able to trust us as well as we need to be able to trust them they know when we have some sort of uh um, you know when Agenda. we're not really listening to yeah that's right that's the word i quite often forget the words i want to use i think it's as getting older <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that a hard thing. <laughs> If I'm writing a blog post, I do a bit of Googling. I think oh, I've got this sort of word. Now I've, I do a bit of Googling to get the synonyms. Oh, yeah, I do go to the thesaurus and have I a look. I live in my thesaurus. Because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, so. I want to get just the right word, right? <laughs> so I know what sort of the right word is, but there I go to get the one that has just the right um tone of what I'm trying to communicate, right? Because words are important. Body language is important. Tone is important. All of those ways of communicating as clearly as you can um, are important, aren't they? They are. And you came to my help then with the word agenda, because that's the perfect word. Hmm. Yes, we have our own agendas, but we don't always admit it. Oh. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, conversations with kids, aren't they so wonderful? They are. They they're amazing. And yeah, I'm I yeah, for years, like from when they were young teens, when situations would come up, even like situations when I wasn't sure what the next um choice or move might be, I would go and seek their um their feedback, have a conversation with them, um, you know, not particularly to say, what would you do or whatever, you know, because they're not me, right? But it's to get their feedback to see how they see it. Because as you said, they don't have a lot of the filters um, that we have ingrained in us from our upbringing. That is a huge part of de-schooling, working through those, even just to be able to recognize when, you know, different um, things from our past are influencing the way we're seeing things now. Like so often if I was out with my kids and something, and I saw something happen with them, I would feel more defensive or something than they would because I would have all my history behind me. And, but they were just in the moment and, and they saw, they saw it so much more clearly than I did. I think that's really wonderful that not usually the parent child relationship is very much one way but I have found that my kids are helping me learn and they're giving me suggestions and looking at the world through my eyes trying to yeah, help me with my situation just as much as I'm doing it for them it's say a 
a family thing Mm -hmm. so that I often talk to them about things that are bothering me and they always have something interesting to say. And that's a wonderful relationship to have, isn't it? Oh, it's a beautiful relationship to have. And it just, like, you've got a wide range of ages, your children, and, and the relationship doesn't change, you know, when they hit 18, does it? It's, it's you know, just like you know, when you're, as we were talking about before, um, to moving to unschooling is really just living the way we were living with young kids. This is the same, like right up through into adulthood when you've developed that. You you mentioned trust before. Trust is a huge thing with me. And, and that's what you're developing with them um, when you're not bringing like that overlay of judgment and expectation. Um, you develop that trust that you're there to happily help each other out, right? Yes, I think that going back to when we were, I was swapping between homeschooling methods, I had no trust. My children could not trust me. Mm -hmm. There was no trust there whatsoever. And I think a lot of, when I talk to people who are beginning unschooling, that the need to build up that trust, not only so that we, we always talk about trusting our children, but they have to be able to trust us as well. And that's a big thing that they deserve our trust and sometimes we've they can't yeah they can't it's, trust us it takes time doesn't it yep yeah it's developing real trust not you have to trust me because i'm your parent or you should trust me because i'm your parent like to show that you are trustworthy by the way you are re- in relationship with them right Yes, we talk so much about how we find it hard to trust our kids, but we don't talk so much the other way around about whether we are trustworthy. Yeah, and that's that's such an important piece. I wanted to just um, you you, you went there um, just now talking about. Um, how you ended up moving through the different kinds of homeschooling methods as you were trying to see what worked best for you guys. Um, So I suspect that was um, one of the most challenging aspects of, of finally getting yourself to unschooling, but I just wanted to touch base and uh, see if there was another challenging aspect that, that you wanted to share. Actually, Getting to unschooling, even though we didn't know that's where we were were headed, Mm -hmm. wasn't so much challenging for us because it was like we were tossing off things and it was getting better and better. We felt we were moving in the right direction. But the challenging thing was being alone, doing it, that we didn't have any support groups. That uh, the unschoolers that I talked about 26 years ago that we met at those conferences they're no longer part of our lives. We live in a fairly isolated community. We've moved away. We moved. We've moved quite a lot, but the only homeschoolers around here are structured homeschoolers. And before we got the internet, and I sort of started blogging about unschooling, very few people we could talk to. And especially when we started along that pathway to unschooling, which was quite some time ago, and we didn't have the internet. Uh, even though we felt happy, it was almost like we kept it to ourselves and you couldn't talk about it to anybody else. Mm. Uh, There were no support groups. And that's the hardest aspect I found because there were days where I questioned what we were doing, even though it felt good. I thought, shouldn't homeschooling be harder than this? Why are all my friends always talking about how they can't get their kids to do this or do that? And I don't have those problems. I just stand back from the conversation. I'll keep quiet. I don't want to get involved because, I mean, what do I say? Then Mm -hmm. I'll say, well, you can do things our way. Don't don't bother doing that. But then they'll probably turn around and say, well, you're really not doing it properly. Really, if you were doing your parental duty properly, you would be doing this, that, on the other. That's your duty as a homeschooling parent. And so sometimes I did question that I was doing enough that, Maybe homeschooling should be a little bit more difficult than it was. Maybe our lives shouldn't be as happy as they were, which I think looking back is pretty ridiculous. I think that that's what we should be doing, building up a happy family life with our kids. A life shouldn't be a struggle, but because we were the only people within a community of other people who were struggling, 
uh, that was difficult. Yeah. Oh, that makes a that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, because um, it, it takes a while to get to that place to understand the value of of that happiness and why it's not doesn't look so hard. And I I love that. I remember you know those first couple of years when we began unschooling, and I would end up you know in um, in groups you know, of friends, et cetera, et cetera, and, and not really mentioning what we were doing because I, I felt I would really need to defend it. And like you said, you were on your own and it didn't have a lot, I didn't have enough in-depth understanding of it. Like it was going well and it made sense. Oh, experience, that's it. Understood it, but without enough experience to really, you know, own that truth. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. And also to toss off those ideas that still threaten to overwhelm us again. Yeah. It does take a long time to get clear of our old ideas, even though we know they're wrong, but they do have that habit of echoing in our minds sometimes. And when people tell you that you're not, that uh, it's your duty to do this, that, or the other, I just stop and question it a few times, but I couldn't go backwards because I couldn't go back to the situation we were in. But, you know, people do say things like, well, you're jeopardizing your kids' futures and it doesn't matter whether you will ruin your relationship because your kids will thank you later on when they're well-educated and they're all set up for life. And I think well, that's rather silly, isn't it? Because they're going to look back on an unhappy childhood and you won't have a new relationship or that you, maybe your relationship will be all right, but it won't be as good as it could have been. And our kids really going to thank us. And what will we give them? Top marks in an exam or something. It really just doesn't add up. And it took a long time to uh, realize that the goal of education and the goal of parenting wasn't what we'd been, I'd been led, people had told me it should be. Mm -hmm. We have totally different ideas about the end product these days. Yeah. We're not working towards high levels, high marks and exams. I mean, kids might want to go to university and all mine who have wanted to have gone. That's, that's something unschoolers can do, but that's not what we're living our lives for. Oh, yeah, that's such a great point. Such a great point. And, and, you know, for the first while, we can be affected by those messages, because they're what we've heard all our lives, right? It takes a, it takes a while to peel back those layers and, and really get comfortable with with a whole new paradigm, a whole bunch of new paradigms, really, all around parenting and learning. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, in a recent episode of your podcast, which is called Stories of an Unschooling Family, and I will have links in the show notes um, so that people can find it. You and your daughter, Sophie, chatted about another unschooling misconception, and we've touched on this a little bit, but um, that the idea that unschooling means drifting kind of aimlessly through your days, that that you don't have a have a plan that you should really just be open and do whatever you come across. So in contrast to that, what has been your family's experience? Well, it took a while to get past that aimlessly drifting through your days misconception because you, know, the, you hear so many stories on the internet about unschoolers who just stay up late, get up the next morning, drift through their days. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with staying up late. Some people are night owls. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's, not, that, that's not the problem. Um, but here's so many negative stories about people who don't really have any goals in with their day. They just go from one thing to another. But, and so for a long time we thought, well, perhaps we're not in schooling properly because we've got so many things we want to do and not enough hours. And yes, I was talking to Sophie oh, several weeks ago about this, and we were talking about how um, because I didn't fill up her days with lots of things that I wanted her to do, she had plenty of time to explore her own interests, her own passions, discover things that she liked doing, things she was good at, all her talents, and then 
And that because I didn't also give her things, goals that she had to achieve, she took on her own challenges. She found out things that she was liked doing, things she was good at. She set herself challenges. And in doing that, she learned that there were things that she wanted to do in her day and how was she going to arrange her day so she could do as much as possible. And I, I find the same thing, that I've just got so many interests, so many things that I want to achieve and I'm not really very good at organising, not as good as my children, but go from one to another. <laughs> but yes, we only have, only have so many hours a day, don't we? And if we just drift... And of course, some days we do drift. I mean, some days we need a rest. We need to just sit around the table and talk. It's not go, go, go. But we've all got, within my family, we've all got so many ideas, so many things we want to do that we get up in the morning and what we, the first thing we say is, what are we going to do today? Mm. What are you working on? And then we all go our own ways and start working or we might work together. But yes, we're certainly not drifting. And I... We've talked about how if we do drift, we waste time. But I mean, we waste t- wasting time sometimes good because I've also talked about how we don't have to be busy every single moment of the day. Wasting time in inverted commas is something we all should do more of. Mm-hmm. But we also have to, if we want to achieve anything, we have to look at it and say, "Well, I've got to work on this a bit today," or. How am I going to get where I want to go? That type of thing. So we're always talking about those sort of things. How how are you getting on with this? How are you getting on with that? What are you going to do today? And that's exciting in itself, watching each other's uh, goals get accomplished, helping each other um, achieve things, working on things together. It's just very, very exciting, I think. And they're all things that we want to do, things that we feel that we have the talents or the interests in, which is totally different to being busy doing schooling or homeschooling, things other people tell you that you have to do. Oh, exactly. I love that because I really uh, enjoyed the conversation around drifting aimlessly. The point that you made at the beginning there where you kind of felt, um, are we really unschooling because we're, you know, we're doing this and we want to do this and we want to accomplish this. And, you know, we're organizing things um, to accomplish our goals, et cetera. Uh, The misconception that, that unschoolers, I think it goes back to, um, you know, not telling them what to do and the conventional assumption that if you don't tell people what they should be doing, children or adults, they don't do anything. Right. That yes. that's I think what might give people the impression that that well they're prob- they're just drifting through their days because they don't have goals, but just because some um, goals aren't imposed on a person, they have their own goals. As you said, everybody's got the things that they want to do, whether it's a whole bunch of things or whether it's a real deep dive into one particular thing, you know people wake up and, and want to do things. And absolutely those quiet days. And in fact, um, my kids wanted those quiet days more than I thought they would when we first began unschooling, right? Because there is so much value in those conversations that come up in those moments where you're, you know, just swinging on the swing or, or just lying down reading or walking in the forest, whatever it is that you're doing um, that allows, you know, your subconscious to process things and to make really cool connections. That's how they come up with all these cool things they're bringing up in our conversations, right? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, I think have that, goals, right? They do. And so you're saying they're about processing. We need quiet times for processing. I think that's another problem sometimes with unschoolers, that when kids are busy, 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 uh, involved with their projects, when they're, we can see them doing something and it's very, very exciting. And then all of a sudden they might drift into a quiet time mm-hmm. and nothing really sparks them any for, for a while. And peer parents get worried and think, oh, look, my child's not interested in anything anymore. What happens? They're not yeah. learning. They're not learning. And how that after a while, our 
we all do it. We, we rise again, we get excited again, and we're off again. And those in-between like, troughs are just a natural part of learning about because we're conditioned by the school system that you have to go to school every day and work hard between these hours and there's never that time to go down and come back up again. You have to perform every single day of the school year but it doesn't really happen in real life that way. Ah, absolutely. I love that. And I think that's something that's so awesome for the kids to experience and learn you know, through through their childhood and, and their teen years is to, because even they can get to a point where they're like, hmm, nothing's really catching my interest anymore. Um, I'm not sure what's going to happen next. But when they've gone through those ups and downs, those troughs, as you were talking about, they they can, I think they can more relax into them when they've had enough experience, enough times that they've come out the other side. Like, you know, even for me now, when I get to that point, I'm most mostly curious. It's like, hmm, I wonder what is eventually, you know, going to catch my attention or how is this eventually going to work out? Because they've been given the space to have those experiences without somebody you know, breathing down their neck that you have to, you know, go choose something, do something here. Like you're not doing anything. Let's go out. Let's, let's do this. Some trying to keep them occupied and not really valuing those quiet moments. Right. That's right. Maybe just trusting that um, learning is happening anyway. And that's just doesn't look the same every single day, week, month of the year, does it? Yeah, and that's yeah, you're right. And and when you look at it from the school perspective too, and what I think one of the reasons that as parents, you know, from growing up, we feel um it's a whole productivity thing, right? That we should be producing something with our time or or it's a waste of our time or that time isn't valued if we don't have, you know, that phrase, we if you don't have something to show for it, right? <laughs> Yes, and that's a very big problem, I think, for registered homeschoolers to actually have things to show. And that's a big step when we unschool is because we don't always have those things. And that's a letting, a letting go of that. Mm-hmm. No, I love that. Now, uh, we've mentioned it a few times, but one of the really interesting things for me about unschooling is how... Um, It soon grew into a way of life for the whole family. You know, I was recognizing my learning. I was recognizing my, you know, rise and fall, my high energy times, low energy times. Um, It became intricately woven into every aspect of all our lives, Unschooling did. So I was uh, hoping you had a story to share about how you have seen that unschooling mindset weave into your adult lives, right? You, maybe you or your husband. Yes, Yes, I'll tell you the story of my husband, Andy. He, we got married straight out of uni. We actually got married on the very last day of our university degree courses (laughs) and I guess this put a bit of pressure on my husband. He had to find a job quickly, Mm -hmm. have family support, and he got a safe and secure job. Well, the first job he could get went into a safe and secure career in business and was in that job for 25 years before he was made redundant one day. And he came home and he just looked so lost. And I was just so sad about the whole thing, how people can just throw people away when they have given their all to something. And he did give his all to his job, even though he didn't particularly like it, but he's the sort of person who, that's not an excuse. He would just do his best. And that was the turning point for him because he came home and he was looking for a new job and he, as quick as he could because when we had seven children, I'm not sure we had six, maybe six children at home then. And uh, I said to him, look, Andy, this is your turn. Why don't you follow your dreams? Go back to uni and do what you really wanted to do right at the beginning. Why don't you go and do your master's of teaching and become a school teacher, which might sound really strange for an unschooler to become a school (laughs) teacher, but I I do think I've worked my way through this one, even though we would never send our children to school. School teachers are necessary because not everybody is going to do what we 
are doing. And there are so many children out there who are in need of a good, caring teacher. And that's the sort of person my husband is. is. He is interested and cares about kids. And at first he just said, oh, I couldn't do that, Sue. You know, we've got the family. We, so we all had a family meeting. Um, I said, well, Dad, you know, what do you think that Dad going back to uni would have to live really frugally for a long time? But I think it's his turn to follow his dreams. And all the kids, yes, yes Dad, you've got to do that, Dad. So he applied to do a Master's of Teaching and went off to uni. I think he was a bit apprehensive because it had been 25 years or so since he was at uni doing his Bachelor's of uh, Science. And university education has changed a lot. Now it's all online and, you know, it's very computer-based. And I think we had one computer per the um, the department at uni. It, uh, we certainly didn't have PCs and we certainly didn't take our computers to university and put them on our laps and record all our notes <laughs> and everything. Yeah. And I said, all in. Eddie, you're defined, you're defined. And also he was going to be one of the oldest students, but he, he had courage. He thought he could do it. We were behind him. He went off to uni and he was there for two years getting his master's. Well, he got to the end of the course and we got this letter one day and it said, um, we would like to congratulate you. You're on the dean's list. And Daddy said, the dean's list? What's the dean's list? And we found out that it was the top 10% of the students, the, the, the top 10% of the, of the student of their marks, you know, they, they'd achieved the, in the top 10 percent yeah and he thought oh, well that's okay and then a few days later he got another letter saying are uh, you we congratulations we're going to award you the dean's medal and that's the top two percent wow and we couldn't believe it <laughs> couldn't believe it at all and and he said well look I've got to go and collect this medal and on this particular day will you come with me he said well go I'm sure they're not going to give it to me we're going to get there and they're going to say I'm very sorry we didn't mean Andy Elvis we meant somebody else no I'm sorry so we laughed about it all the way there we got there and when we got to the desk there there was his all his information his name tag and everything and it appeared he was getting the dean's medal so I sat there very proud wife he got his dean's medal but the medal wasn't the important thing what we learned from that was that when you're passionate about something when you're really interested in what you're learning and you have a goal you want to achieve learning isn't a problem at all he didn't know that medal existed he went back as a mature age student he didn't even know how to do oh he was very uh, good with computers. He used them with work, but for, um, for educational purposes, for his course, he had to learn lots of skills about uh, forums and chat rooms and reporting and all that. And yeah, he got the Dean's Medal and my kids, you know, they were just so proud of my husband. It's like turning the tables. Instead of us being proud of our kids, they were proud of him. And I think they, he gave, gave them a vision of Anything is possible. Follow your dreams. Do what you really want to do. Uh, you might not have the same job for the rest of your life. You don't have to do something secure and safe, though maybe some people think teaching is, but it wasn't secure and safe option for his middle years. It might have been at the beginning. Uh, that is never too late to learn. Um, but, and also that when we learn, we don't have to learn everything when we're children or teenagers. We can learn when we have a need. And my husband learned so much because he had a need in you know his middle years. He wanted to do something. He learned the skills. He was passionate. He went on. He got the Dean's Medal. Um, yeah, and we encouraged him. We had to trust a lot because our life changed a lot over those two years. But it was a wonderful two years as well because we had a house full of learners. I had another son who was at uni. I'm not sure if my uh, my daughter Imogen was also at uni at that time. But we had unschoolers, you know, registered homeschools. We were all learning, and we'd all get up every morning, talk about what we were learning for the day, what our plans were, encourage each other, help each other out. My husband would ask my kids about something to do with the computer because they'd done online learning. And, yes, we just 
it brought us really close together and taught us a lot about family and learning and life and how you don't have to make up your mind about your life's job when you're a teenager, that you can change, you can learn new things along the way, and you can succeed with whatever you want to do if, if you're interested enough, if you're passionate about what you want to do. So I guess those are the, the, the example, the, what the lessons we learned from um, my husband's experience of going back to uni and becoming a school teacher. <laughs> <laughs> It's so funny when, when, you know, you, you start with that, he went to university to become a school teacher, but yes, that's a, an amazing story with how that's just completely wove into your lives, right? That's awesome. An unschooling story about a school teacher. Yeah. Yes. It's a good talking point. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I love that. And I love how, you know, it, it's fascinating that because he was, like you said, just doing some, he was making this choice as something that he wanted to learn. He wanted to do, you know, what a beautiful example of, of just following your passion for, for something that you're interested in, regardless of your age. And it's okay to do it at any age. What a beautiful example of lifelong learning, you know, for your kids, just, just having it, weave through your family no matter what the age and then you know so the goal you know wasn't the marks the goal wasn't the the medal or the dean's list or anything like that those were wonderful surprises at the end right but yeah he didn't even know they existed did he <laughs> no that's right and I think it's a good good story for people who are worried about cramming things into kids yeah. as much as possible, thinking that they're not, this is their one and only opportunity to learn. Of course mm -hmm. it's not. We learn when we have a need and anybody can learn. Yeah, that's spectacular. Now, our last question, I'm very excited to hear. What has surprised you most about your family's unschooling adventures? Well, I guess that we set out to find the perfect way to educate our kids. And we were surprised to find out how unschooling took over our whole lives. Uh -huh. And we have learned so much about ourselves, uh, you know, not just our children, but each, each of us has learned a lot about ourselves and each other. And I think the thing we've learned the most about is unconditional love, how that has drawn our family so much, so close together that in accepting each other, accepting each other's talents, each other's goals, are uh, so helping, encouraging, trusting each other, not worrying about mistakes but forgiving each other, that type of thing that we learnt to love each other without condition. And that has really brought us very, very uh, strong bonds. To, you know, we're, we're a strong family. And I think that is the most surprising thing. I never thought that when we set out on this journey 26 years ago, that the end product would be love, would be our family. I thought maybe well-educated children. I didn't think we'd all get involved in our own learning as well. The things that we've all been able to achieve and to see everybody develop as a person. So the, the relationships there, but also it is so exciting seeing each individual person in the family blossom to use their talents to become the people they can be. And that, that's sort of a lifetime process. But, yeah, we're at school growing up. I didn't feel that I was anyone very special at all. I wasn't popular. I was told I didn't have any particular talents. Uh, I was clever enough, but there was nothing Nobody gave me the opportunity to discover what I was really interested in, nothing that made me feel excited. And I feel that everybody in our family is excited about who they are, what they've got to share, and not only within the family, but we want to go with uh, outside the family and see what we can do with our talents, share them with other people. And because we've got a strong family home base, we can go out there in the world, support and encourage each other. And who knows, you know, what else we will do. Uh, it's just an exciting journey, I think. And it's one that's not going to end. 
uh, unlike homeschooling in you know, age 18, this unschooling journey is just going to keep on going and going. And even though my kids are getting older and I'm not no longer going to have um, children under 18 for, for very much longer, I've been another four years and my youngest daughter will be 18, but who knows what's ahead. I think we don't know, do we, that the opportunities that come up we cannot see. We go places that we have never imagined, and that's what's exciting, I think. Wow. Yeah, that, that was beautiful, Sue. And I love that that it, it's the excitement, right? It's the openness the, of we don't know what's going to happen, right? It's it's an adventure. We're, we're just open to what crosses our paths that we find interesting. And I loved how you talked about how they are, you know, excited to be themselves. What a great story, you know, juxtaposed with your experience growing up, right? That, that when we're in school in that we're, you know, doing the same things as everybody else and we have to follow this path, we don't have that time to discover who we are and what makes us unique and the things we find interesting. And even, you know, one thing I love seeing over the years with my kids, the different things that they found interesting, but then noticing the thread of of what's uniquely them that, that flows through all of those interests, right? There's just a little something in each one. It's like, that's why that particular child found that interesting and that and that. You can see those connections, can't you? You can. And I think it's very sad that when we are temp- we could be tempted to uh, make our kids be who we think they are. And then when we let them be themselves, it's just remarkable, you know, that each and every one of us has so much to offer. And if we are allowed to be the people we are, um, yeah, it's, it's exciting, but where will we all go? And I think that's, I, I've come to terms with the fact that I'm not that bad a person after all. That, you know, that, and that sounds terrible, but leaving school, leaving uni, I felt like I was a disappointment to everybody. I mean, I got the marks I needed, but... I didn't fulfill people's expectations. People wanted me to do this, that, and the other, and I didn't. And now unschooling, I feel just like my children, that I have something to offer, and I'm not that bad after all, that I have a place in the world. You know, you understand that? Oh, me? Absolutely. <laughs> I, it's what a way for us to discover ourselves too, right? It's It takes away that measure. Um, you know, because I remember when I, even when I left work to to stay home with the kids, it that was one of the biggest pieces, you know, how am I going to, who am I now, right? Because I was just so used to measuring myself uh, by that conventional yardstick, right, of, of accomplishments, of that productivity. Um, but it was just just amazing how we too, as we work through those layers, we can discover who we really are and the ways that we, uh, the things we love to do, the interests that we have, and the way we we shine. And and parenting being one of those interests that that we discover, right? And and ways to connect with our kids and just appreciating and loving that we can just live with our kids. Like you said, one of the most surprising things was how this was really, when we started, a question of how we were going to educate our kids, right? What were we going to replace school with if they weren't going to go to school? And that it grew into being how we choose to live our lives, right? Yes, yes. Well, thank you so, so much for taking the time to speak with me today, Sue. It was so much fun. Thank you. It has been a lot of fun for me, Pam. I must say I was a little bit apprehensive. I've been stepping outside my comfort zone here, but it was something that I really wanted to do. And listening to your podcast, I knew that you would make it easy. You are so warm and friendly. And I thought, yeah, 
I'll be all right, Pam. We'll make sure that I'm okay. And I have to say, it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you and so glad that I had the courage to do this. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Sue. I really appreciate it. And I had so much fun. I'm glad you did too. And it's morning there, isn't it? As I see, it's getting dark out here (laughs) in Canada. (laughs) Yes, we have um, just started our day. We started talking about eight o'clock this morning. So yes, (laughs) we got the whole day ahead of us. Yay. Well, have a wonderful day, Sue. Thank you so much, Pam. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast. While you're there, be sure to check out the second book in my Living Joyfully with Unschooling series, Free to Live, Create a Thriving Unschooling Home. In it, I dive into the four characteristics that I found helped unschooling flourish in our home. Curiosity, patience, strong relationships, and trust. One reviewer wrote, Really enjoyed this short and sweet book. It has marvelous one-liners, and though I'm not an underliner, I found myself underlining on every page. Another said, I believe it would benefit any homeschooler or parent to read this book as it re-emphasizes the importance of the relationship between a parent and a child in the learning process. I plan to reread this book. It is rich and full of gems. Give yourself some time to absorb it before rushing into unschooling. Until next time, have fun living and learning with your family.